So hello, I'm Isaac Nellist with Green Left, and we're here today talking again with Sin and Daniel and Amaya, who are from the US. They're uh, all involved in the student encampment movement, which erupted about a month and a half ago. And as you know, it's been a huge part of the Palestine solidarity movements all around the world, but particularly in the US and here in Australia as well, where I think it got to about 13 universities here in Australia that had uh, solidarity encampments set up. Now, here in Australia, the movement is uh, we're heading into the university breaks and exams. So a few of the encampments have shut down and a few of them have won um, certain parts of their demand, such as um, disclosure uh, of the deals with weapons companies, etc. Um, but the, you know, the movement con is continuing. So it's, we're excited to hear a bit about how it has developed over in the US. I'll just say we are recording here in Australia on stolen land. I'm speaking from uh, Gadigal land and the, uh, was, the land was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So um, thanks for coming back to talk to us guys. It was, it was really interesting our last conversation and anyone who's watching this one should definitely go back and uh, hear, hear the previous uh, interview. Um, so I guess to start off, I just wanted to ask uh, over this kind of month and a half since the encampments were set up, what have been some of the major developments and um, I guess some of the, uh, yeah, what's happened, where's the movement currently kind of sitting um, and what kind of wins have been achieved or what, uh, yeah, what wins have been achieved over the last uh, period? Well, yeah, I can take this first. Um, so, hey, everyone, glad to be back. Thanks so much for organizing the follow-up. Um, yeah, last we talked, we were um, in the most explosive period of the movement within the first two weeks or so after the movement first launched at Columbia. Since then, more than 140 encampments have been set up, uh, not just in the U.S., but in countries around the world. The U.K. has, like, I think more than a dozen, uh, Canada, Brazil, France, and, of course, Australia. Um, we've seen really divergent responses from the administration at the start of the movement. I think the major headline was just the immense repression, especially uh, seen at schools on the East Coast. Um, but it's ranged from that to like radio silence from schools in the hopes that the protest movement is going to fizzle out. Um, and also... In some places, there have been negotiations. Oftentimes, these are not nego uh, negotiations that are uh, approached in good faith by the administration. Uh, the administration's, you know, uh, strategy has, you know, largely been to channel the energy of the activists on the streets into backdoor meetings, you know, where they hope to confuse us and demobilize us. But other negotiations have taken place and and have won more uh, potent concessions and and empowering terms that don't necessarily require uh, uh, campers to demobilize or, you know, give up their right to free speech in a certain way. It really depends on the, the local context. So I would say, yeah, we've seen some divergent responses. Um, one obstacle that people anticipated pretty early on was the, the approach of the end of the semester. We've hit that for most schools, pretty much all of them, except for like some quarter system schools, especially in the West Coast. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, people were uncertain about the longevity of the movement, and I think people had different power analyses about how to, like, approach the end of the semester. You know, do we have enough power to risk a sweep and uh, and stand up to the police? Um, some people, I think, you know, had the sense that major wins around divestment had to be won by the end of the semester and fears that things would fizzle out. And so that kind of encouraged people to have these, like, final confrontational, like, battles with the police, with the administration. And, you know, we can debate whether we had enough power to do that, you know, whether the student movement is going to have to go through multiple iterations before we win divestment demands, what, how we relate to things in, in the long term, you know, and, and just past the semester. So that was an interesting debate that arose. Um, uh, around the time of the end of the semester, there were a bunch of actions around commencement or, or graduation, you know, ranging from from individual acts of resistance to more coordinated uh, banner drops, walkouts, chants, and stuff of that nature. Last weekend, um, May 24th through 26th in Detroit, there was this conference called, uh, I think, the People's Conference for Palestine or something like that, convened um, primarily by PYM, but with a bunch of sponsoring organizations. Sorry, PYM is Palestinian Youth Movement. Um, and it cohered some of the best pro-Palestinian activists around the country, not just students, although there were a lot of you know students who participated in the encampments, um, but there were people from all sectors of society who have, you know, been involved with street mobilizations, um, boycotts, stuff, you know, everything. It was a very, you know, pluralistic space. And, um, you know, uh, emerging out of it, this was like the first, you know, attempt, I think, uh, of its kind to bring all these people together in one room. And, you know, as you can imagine, you're not going to debate every single thing at that weekend. But in, it was really great in terms of just, it was, it was so impressive and heartening and it's definitely getting the ball rolling in terms of crafting more, um, 
uh, focus, like strategic plans. And now all these people, you know, know each other, have met each other, have each other's numbers and stuff like that. So um, I would say that's largely where we're at now. And I would say that the tasks of this phase were, where uh, when the upsurge has largely kind of ended, or at least uh, at the school level, the, the tasks mainly are to like consolidate all the amazing activists we've met through this process, whose ideas have been rapidly changing, giving uh, to give them on ramps to more, you know, permanent organization to to clarify what, what are the victories we've had? What are the lessons we've learned? How do we deal with these challenges in the future and to craft um some plans uh for the fall semester when things are going to ramp back up so yeah i'll try to add some of this stuff um on top of what sin have said yeah again thank you so much for organizing this so cool to be uh with you guys again it's been you know a crazy month so much stuff have happened since last time we spoke and and since like the last encampment um you know it's really been i think heartening seeing yeah, I think Sin was right, and there was a mix of, um, you know, victories and losses and different outcomes on different campuses. But I think it's really been heartening to see uh, our comrades across the country winning, you know, divestment and winning disclosure, pressuring like boards of trustees and local administration, drawing out this power analysis of students against, uh, you know, the, the rich donors and, you um, their own student administrations and I don't know whoever is in power on campuses and I think that's there was an exercise that helped clearly develop class consciousness that politicized students and is now turning them into uh, organizers and activists in real time. Um, we've over the past months we've been highlighting all the victories that you know fellow white ASA members uh, have achieved on different campuses I guess shout out to uh, San Francisco State University, shout out to University of Oregon, uh, Brown University, that of pressure administration for a divestment vote. So did I think believe really UO. Um, I think the biggest question, and maybe we'll we'll definitely need to touch that upon later, is the question of how these student protesters in this like classic Kameo fashion maybe uh turned the wheels of the labor movement and then now kind of sparked different kind of political uh dynamics and different kind of political movement that is that went you know beyond our campuses um something that maybe for me personally was really exciting and i think was very productive is the the levels and the amount of like political discussion that we were able to have around this and as we kind of lived through it and now we maybe organic past this organic peak of the incumbent movement because you know the, 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 the schools are mostly dispersed and the summer is here i think it's a combination of you know physical exhaustion and as well as you know just generally i guess like or peak i think of organic activity has been reached and now we i think spend a lot of time thinking that you know like this isn't over you know we didn't win like the 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 atrocities in rafa and gaza is still ongoing so like what else do we need to do and discussing that internally almost like an onion has been like really productive you know i think we've been cohering our perspectives First, internally within the Bread and Roses, you know, our tendency in DSA and in YDSA, which me and Sin are part of, where we cohere and discuss and share different perspectives. And then we bring these perspectives in the discussion and they brought a layer of YDSA members. So like cadre members of cadre organizations, where we also discuss and share much more different, broader perspectives. And then as YDSA members, we are uh, going into the movement and then we share our, you know, postures and testaments of our political Discussions which are often center, you know, questions of internal democracy, mass movement orientation, um, and stuff like that, that, you know, like class struggle. Uh, and I think that was really exciting. It was really fruitful. And I think our biggest task, as Sin has mentioned right now, is to like not let the energy die out. Think about how can we capture that layer of organized politicized students. Um, you know, something we think about in, in New York specifically, uh, that is, you know, broader than just already activated YDSA. Uh, or like just you know, like politicize students and how can we hit the the ground running and organize uh in the fall because it is it is certainly notable that despite this maybe again just to repeat myself this organic peak has been reached uh it's certainly not over and I think there's going to be much more exciting molten stuff in the summer but we just need to go here and figure out what exactly it will look like yeah um I want to jump into kind of like the next kind of question um and i'll just start off i guess with a bit of a comment just um reflecting a bit on some of the experiences of uh the student movement here 
So one of the things um, we want to kind of ask is about what are some of the examples of the wins that have kind of been achieved by some of these uh, student encampments? Because the experience that we have had in uh, Australia is the main thing that has been achieved at the at one of the main campuses has been um, has been disclosure. Now there has been obviously there's a lot of political issues with disclosure because. Um, there hasn't been any guarantee that they're going to be disclosing uh, the right things in terms of their relationships with weapons manufacturers, especially given the fact that uh, some of this disclosure is subject to uh, laws around uh, national security. Um, but of course, there's also, but there's obviously, we know that there has been examples, I think in even Spain, where they have achieved a full, full divestment. So I kind of want to hear about the type of wins that have been achieved, but also how do they fit within the spectrum from disclosure to divestment and what have been some of the debates as well about this? Because we also have the particularly negative example in Western Australia where the student union uh, basically signed, uh, did a behind the scenes uh, door, behind the scenes door with um, university um, administration to basically agree to a disclosure deal that was actually not very good and wasn't, uh, wasn't endorsed by the camp in a democratic way. Yeah, a lot of those uh, challenges sound familiar. So, I mean, one thing that I've been surprised by is that we've already seen significant movement towards disclosure and divestment at a significant number of schools. A lot of the CSU schools, sorry, CSU's is California State University system, um, including schools like SFSU, Sacramento, SFSU, um, sorry, uh, San Francisco State University at Brown University in Rhode Island. They forced a divestment vote at University of Oregon. I don't think they've won uh, really explicit divestment language, but they've won things like, you know, scholarships for Palestinian students, starting academic relationships, um, you know, for with people who have been displaced and whatnot. Um, at, at Occidental College, there's been um, full di di divestment, seemingly. Um, and I think the commonalities across all these schools is that, or at least a lot of them, had a really rich prior history of organizing around the issue. Um, but it's quite confounding, especially the CSU schools, because um, one thing that makes the CSU schools really interesting to watch is that it's, it's, it's this large university university system. I attend one of those uh, at the UC system, the University of California. And, you know, the largely the playbook at the UCs has been administration very cleverly uh, pursuing campus level negotiations and picking off camps one by one because they know that campus level negotiations can't really touch the investment portfolio. You know, the, the, the president of that specific campus can say like, you know, I'm sympathetic to you guys. I'll release a statement. I'll look into it. But ultimately, this decision rests with our board of regents, which is beyond me. So it's kind of confusing that, you know, this is really the playbook that we've seen there. Meanwhile, at CSUs, we've seen individual university presidents say, I'm going to, you know, divest from, um, uh, you know, uh, companies implicated in arms manufacturing and stuff like that. So that's that's a difference that I actually don't have like a good theory for. I'm curious to hear if Daniel, uh, Daniel, you've thought about it. Um, but at those schools, we've seen some really, um, you know, impressive wins already. Um, but mostly where where there are negotiations, things have been more in the middle. Like like I said before, the the administration's posture is largely to like say, let's let's get a meeting together. We're gonna try to corner you into a back room. We're, we're gonna make things more legalistic and confusing. Let's set up a task force or a committee that's gonna meet two years from now. Oftentimes these deals don't have clear stipulations about like when these bodies are gonna meet, you know, who's gonna sit on them. If if it exists, it's probably gonna be like mostly our friends as you know, the donor class or the, the administration as opposed to like students and like workers at the university. And so I suspect that most schools that have entered negotiations are probably in this gray area where we've seen deals, some of them more empowering, others more demobilizing. Um, but in addition to like the, the uh, victories and progress around the main demands of the movement, we've also had immense internal like organizational victories um, and, and, you know, political victories for the movement itself in terms of like its degree of politicization and organization. So one thing that I have to shout out and I hope, um, uh, May hops on because this is uh, their school. SFSU won, uh, demanded and won this practice of open bargaining. And historically, open bargaining has you know been a practice of and demand of some of the most powerful and you know democratic labor unions. You know, I, I don't, I can. I, I don't know uh, the, the listener base, so I hope it's not like repeating information that's like, you know, already common sense to people. But the idea behind open bargaining is that every member of the movement, but, you know, also the broader the community and like the case of SFSU should be engaged in the bargaining process. Not because it's just morally good. It totally is, but it's 
strategic for building power. Um, open open bargaining is often conducted by, you know, allowing people to witness the negotiations on the one hand, but also crucially having meetings beforehand, um, you know, caucus meetings in the middle of negotiations even, and, and uh, crucially debrief meetings after to develop a strategy so that our bargaining team doesn't get cornered by the administration when they go in there, um, you know, and people can see the, you know, really radicalizing stuff that the admin says and, and you know, make choices for themselves about what the best way to, to conduct negotiations and carry the movement forward. Um, and this has been important because a lot of uh, challenges that we've seen could be mitigated by open bargaining. For example, like, you know, camps that don't have open bargaining, oftentimes political conflicts will become super personalized. People who don't get to see the negotiations will just start blaming their camp leaders saying, you know, you're a sellout, you're a bureaucrat, you accepted a dumb deal. And all of a sudden there's this vitriol in the movement as opposed to, you know, more of the firepower being directed towards administration. So that's, you know, one reason open bargaining is important. We got to help <laughs> leaders build unity with the ranks and, you know, they can use that to cover their asses. But also it's about, you know, democracy is power. The more people you can engage in critical thinking and, and expose this process to, the stronger, you know, the ideas generated are going to be, the more ideas you generate, you know, stuff like that. And so um, that's been a huge win. And I just see, uh, I saw that a may just hopped on the line. So hopefully they can expand on that. A little bit. And then the other thing I wanted to shout out to was uh, uh, in, in my context in the University of California system, there's a really special development happening. UAW 4811, the union of 48,000 uh, student workers across the UC system is on strike. It's a political strike for Palestine and free speech. I mean, if you look at the, the letter of like the legal argument, it might seem a little more dry and boring. You know, the university has failed to guarantee like a safe campus climate or like, you know, it's repressed free speech in other ways. But if you have any proximity to strike, you know, it's about Palestine because all these people were in the camps they were you know getting maced in the face at la and stuff and this is really significant because you know political strikes aren't are not necessarily without precedent in the u.s history but it's a very new experience for people in my generation and so it's like a really open door and i think it could shape the the possibilities around labor action for you know broad political demands well into the future and i could speak a little bit more about the more about that later but um yeah daniel and ame if you guys want to add I'll just jump in. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Amay. It's great to have you back. Um, we'd love to hear about what Sim was just talking about um, with the open organizing at, at San Francisco State. And also, Sim, we'll definitely talk more about the, the union action as well. Um, but maybe we'll just go to Amaya and then we'll hear from Daniel as well. Um, but yeah, really interesting stuff. Yeah, um, so San Francisco State had open bargaining uh, pretty early on in the process. Uh, and uh, through open bargaining, we, uh, first of all, were able to put a lot of pressure on the campus administration in the first place because of the fact of uh, the, the, the whole idea of it being in public, meaning that, you know, our campus president, Lim Honey, she had to be held accountable in front of a lot of people that weren't necessarily campers or just like even um, people involved with the Palestine movement in general. Uh, but just concerned, like, you know, campus goers and concerned citizens. Uh, and so that affected our, uh, like, the, the our strategy a lot. Essentially, through open bargaining, we were able to essentially uh, get this university to at least listen to us. Uh, and so where we're at right now is that we have gotten three of our four demands basically met. Uh those three demands being disclose, divest, and defend. Uh, and uh, the fourth one, which is the demand for uh, this camp, the administration of our campus to declare what's happening in Gaza a genocide, uh, that is the only uh, demand that we were not able to get. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but that doesn't mean that we have stopped pushing for it. Um, but basically, where we're where our movement is at right now is getting the campus administration to follow through with the first three demands and also to push push for the fourth one. Uh, so in terms of, you know, disclosing, divesting, and um, defending, that means uh, on her part and the not just the campus administration or the campus president herself, but also uh, working with the leaders at our camp and also some of the faculty members that were part of the, uh, the camp and um, a part of open bargaining. Uh, but basically... What, where we're at is we're, we're getting the administration to work with us to to follow through. So to create a website di disclosing what kind of investments uh, that San Francisco State has that have gone towards uh, the genocide of the Palestinian people. Um, divesting is a sec like that. It directly follows that. 
and uh, she says she's committed to it. And uh, the third one was uh, defending, essentially defending uh, the Arab and Muslim student body from Islamophobia and from hate and from anti-Palestinian uh, vitriol and, uh, and attacks and that kind of thing. Uh, and she has committed to that. Um, but when it comes to things like a website or when it comes to things like actually like, you know, putting that in writing, whatever investments that are there, uh, it does take a lot of like following up on her part. And also the responsibility of getting her to follow up is on us. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Just kind of working through that, um, making sure she's not stalling us. Cause I know that that's been a thing across uh, encampments in the country as well as uh, in our state, California. Um, but open bargaining, I would say definitely is like a like a big win. It, it's it kind of does set like a good example. And uh, after San Francisco State did open bargaining, uh, the University of San Francisco and a bunch of other uh, campus uh, campuses across the country have also engaged in open bargaining with their campus administrations, like their respective um, presidents or whatnot, um, to at least start the start start a dialogue and kind of get the ball rolling uh, when it comes to things like uh, divesting and uh, disclosing these types of investments. Uh, another thing is, um, and I'm going off of the, the list of uh, things that we're going to touch on or the questions, but uh, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of police activity across a lot of the camps uh, across the country as well as uh, California in general. Um, within San Francisco, I'm aware that uh, University of California, San Francisco, so UCSF, had their encampment basically just like taken down, raided by the police a bunch. Uh, and then there's Un University of San Francisco, so just USF. I know it's a little confusing, but they had their... They had open bargaining, but then uh, the the administration wouldn't really listen, and uh, they had to, like they had to basically take the camp down, um, or rather, it was by force. It was like taken down. Uh, I think they also like recamped in the middle, and it was taken down again, and things like that. So, uh, definitely has been a significant factor in terms of planning and stuff for all camps, regardless of it's like within my public university system or not but um on our part that de definitely like like for san francisco state it definitely played into like the planning and what we were prepared for with regards to like safety and also with regards to just like um like protocols in terms of what happens when the police arrive what the best course of action to be for individuals uh, would be uh things like that so it does affect uh us but like I mean, I've said this before, SF State honestly has not faced the like nearly the amount of police violence and aggression that other campuses have. So we've been a little fortunate when it comes to that. But that doesn't mean we're not prepared for the worst. Um, there were a lot of different types of setbacks um, that we faced um, um, during the planning of the camp, uh, during the camp itself. Uh, a lot of, I mean, some of this is just sort of, like, natural. Like, of course, people are going to, there's going to be, like, Discord. Uh, and by Discord, I mean, like, the actual term Discord, not, like, the like the, the chat platform. Uh, but there's, like, you know, a lot of, like, disagreements and, like, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, those are stuff that, you know, you just kind of have to work through as a group and, like, just keep center, uh, center a goal, like, center, like, a after disagreement like um what what would we want to work towards like just like keeping that at the forefront and working through whatever disagreements people have uh although i will admit it wasn't too big of a deal um i mean I, and a lot of these disagreements stem from how we do certain actions or like how we like whether we should even coordinate some uh, which we later agreed to like coordinate pretty much everything so that everybody's in the same page on the same page. Uh, I think keeping everybody on the same page definitely is not only like useful in terms of just coordinated like effective actions, but also just in terms of just like in the, for the sake of like transparency and so that there's nobody's like miffed afterwards. Like for for that sake, it's also really uh, good to keep everybody on the same page. 
Um, and I think, yeah, we have learned a lot of like different types of like lessons in terms of just like how to handle this sort of stuff or, um, you know, if there is a problem, how do we, uh, first of all, deal with it, but also, you know, how do we work towards, you know, something that's bigger than that, um, and work through it. And, um, so yeah, and that, that's definitely playing, um, that's playing a part in terms of like the kind of actions that we will be taking uh, going forward because um, where we are at the moment is like at SF State is that like, yeah, the administration has agreed to three out of four demands, but that's still not all of them. And also, uh, you know, it's summer break now for, for most college campuses. But again, I mean, like it's, it's summer break for college campuses and college students and maybe faculty um it, you know palestinians in gaza don't have a break in terms of like you know <laughs> like israel suddenly stopping uh the bombardment and this the siege so you know our our collective kind of duty is to still raise our uh, raise awareness about that and, and not just awareness but you know really pressure our administration to meet that fourth demand uh and to follow through with the first three uh since it does have a tangible impact on the amount of funds that as the Israeli military uh, receives. Just on this, like I, I'd, I'd love to go a bit deeper into, you know, the role of the unions and organized workers and things like that at the various campuses. And it's really awesome to hear about, um, you know, how successful the SFSU camp has been winning like three of the four demands. And I'm sure, you know, there's going to be continued pressure going on. Um, as the movement continues, I just uh, wanted to see if Daniel had any uh, thing to add about um, wins that have been achieved by the encampments, and then we can kind of you know move on to some of these other topics that have that have come up as well. Yeah, I, I mean, funny enough, I don't I think actually have a lot to add because I feel like I've been learning as much as uh, I guess like observing here from the East Coast in New York City as anybody else in the movement, and again. Campus like SFSU has been, I think, a trailblazing organizing model for many of us, kind of in the our organization, but then maybe in the left and student movement in general. Um, yeah, but it's just the situation in New York City sim in New York City seems so kind of grim and dire, like a lot of po police violence, brutality, and I think we're just kind of trying to reconvene our strengths while also writing down lessons from other parts of the country and yeah i feel like throughout this whole time i've been eternally grateful to be part of you know ydsa and part of the left because i was able to you know use this network of activists and organizers across the country and you know it really felt like one big movement and wins across different campuses felt like uh you know a win for us all um yeah but new york city seemed very very dim very violent and very repressing and it's kind of still ongoing you know we've not be able to win as much of that kind of political maybe wrestling around like two main points of like student organization became something like we would push as like as a few model of like student proto-student unionism and like open democracy open bargaining borrowing these tactics from militant uh, labor movements versus kind of much more secret culture of like camp leadership um we kind of came to refer to sort of opsecism where it's like you know the, the kind of shadow leadership not a lot of democracy for the sake of i guess like efficiency and like the choices are being made by unelected group of people and the bargaining team is happening like what maybe sin have mentioned like behind those closed doors and these uh tiny spaces where it's much easier to be um uh, you know confused and disorganized but i think yeah with that said we're trying to reconvene we're trying to like organize students we're trying to like continue push for this orientation uh and in the meantime you know i think we continue highlighting the wins across the country maybe like one thing that is i think is very political that worth mentioning is i guess again i'm looking at like university of oregon which is like right on the other end of the country that are who's, you know, a student workers union is now in this process of open bargaining 
uh, for their like first contract right after you know they won some of their demands precisely through the same tactic in the encampment movement. Uh, yeah, and it's just been really incredible to you know see our comrades you know lead the way in this such militant and democratic manner. Um, yeah, and it's just like it really shows that it's very connected and the struggles are very intertwined with one another. Um, yeah, and I'm just really excited to see them win, and I hope many more people will kind of pick up that mode of organizing. It's good to hear from all of you again, and congratulations on all your hard work and staunch activism in getting some of these, some of your demands met, even though the responsibility still falls to you to follow those demands up, um, and fighting for genuine opening, open bargaining as well. Um, we might hear more about uh, some of the union action a, a bit later, if that's okay. But just to touch on some of the police repression, because we've heard that more than 3,000 people have been arrested or detained on, camp on campuses across the country. And um, you were saying before the encampments have, some of the encampments have been taken down and students have been threatened with academic consequences for taking a stand at their university. It's against Israel's genocidal assault. Um, and many, many people have experienced police harassment or violence. And you mentioned students being maced in the face. I um, may you mentioned the raids. Um, but we want to hear maybe from other comrades your thoughts on how the movement is actually dealing with this kind of repression and how this is impacting the movement. Yeah, I'm happy to say a little bit. So, I mean, the factor that made the movement explode initially, both numerically and, you know, also, which helped the movement gain space in public consciousness was certainly the repression. Obviously, it's, you know, but a tiny fraction of the violence Palestinians have been facing for decades, but it, we would be wrong to discount how potent it's been for people's radicalization, you know, for better, for worse, seeing your nearest and dearest get brutalized or during repression yourself can have uniquely radicalizing effects and be a stepping stone to a broader solidarity, especially for people who are not already Palestine, uh, politicized sorry, around Palestine. You know, the re repression has forced many people to ask, like, why are liberal democratic, supposedly democratic institutions going to such great lengths to clamp down on free speech and to suppress the pro-Palestine movement? Um, so that's been a very effective segue uh, into the material interests that are at play, namely, you know, the Zionist lobby, you know, U.S. imperial ambitions, the donor class that stands behind each school's uh, regents or, or board of trustees or whatnot. Um, also, that combined with the power of social media has been really, really influential. I mean, you know, uh, I think that deserves to mention, you know, many commentators have called this like the first genocide, uh, first live stream genocide, you know, the capitalist control of most of the world's media apparatus, the spread of dissident opinions has never been easier, I think. And, um, you know, many socially conscious, curious college students probably find it almost impossible to avoid sympathetic coverage in a lot of parts of the country. Um, so, you know, for many of us, it's like the first thing we see in the morning, just like this repression. And 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 I think the social media aspect has really closed the distance between the institutions we act, interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and their effects out in the world. A lot of people, you know, have been talking about like um, retrospectors or comparisons with movements of the past. And, you know, Vietnam is brought up a lot and they're like, why is this movement so powerful or so radicalizing when, you know, we're not directly implicated in a draft? And I think maybe the social media plus the repression element has a lot to do with that because, you know, when you have this combination, you know, we see images of mutilated bodies every day, hospitals and schools bombed to oblivion, every kind of mass suffering possible. And so these consequences through, you know, the power of social media, especially, you know, they're not as abstract anymore. You know, we get to see what our universities and investments fund, you know, what administrations, the liberal media and, and, and political elites are running cover for. So that's that's another way these things have been made more real and visceral for people. Um, the um, repression has also brought a lot of, you know, strategic complications, as you can imagine. You know, on the one hand, we don't want to be silenced or give the impression that we're embarrassed or intimidated from speaking up. But if we look realistically at, at the power that most camps have right now, we haven't really saturated or built a majority on campus. We're not sure if we can withstand, you know, the police who are going to bombard us over the course of the night and stuff. Um, do we fight them head on? Do we, you know, maybe regroup or like, you know, pack up before cur curfew and come back tomorrow? These are all questions that we have to decide. And I think this kind of relates to the thing, the dynamic or, or strategic question that I brought up beforehand is just like, what is our analysis of our power right now? Are, can we really readily exploit the divisions and the bureaucracy? Do we think divestment is re realistically on the horizon for us? Do we think this is going to be a multiple semester kind of campaign in our, at our school or whatever? And so, so without clarity on these questions, it makes it really hard to decide whether or not, you know, or how exactly we deal with police repression. Yeah, maybe I can add some of the stuff 
that I think we're thinking about in New York City and like what do you say in general? But um, at least in New York, I mean, curious like what what it's like in other parts of the country as well, especially California. Um, it seems like the post encampment movement, which I think was, you know, like the moment where it ended was a very, like a violent, very kind of cathartic moment and very radicalizing moment for the many. It seems like, you know, at the, at the time, like the, I don't know, quote unquote, strategicness of the encampment, like wasn't even a question. Like it was, it really felt like a movement across the country that then sparked to be an international movement. And we see like encampments sparked in both in solidarity, but also to demand their own demands of divestment and disclosure uh, and ceasefire on, on, on each campus. And now kind of as we just like live in this, like maybe post encampment movement, because to me, it seems like the moment for encampments, at least in New York City, at least in, in the United States is kind of past. So now we need to think about like, what are other ways we, we can, you know, use this maybe time of summer break of this maybe relative, I don't know, quietness kind of seize of activity as the moment of reassessing where our power lies, power map our campuses and think about like what would be like strategic focal points on our campuses to organize through, I guess, points of view, both, I don't know, of economic power that we as students have have as someone who contribute to you know, the university intuition and in labor in many instances, but also, you know, academically, like, I don't know, academic boycotts and, you know, college students, you know, our life at university, like we're right, we think, we we, I don't know, we produce things, you know, it's at its, it, 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 it's at its core, um, you know, using this time to really reassess that power and maybe find other strategic leverages and strategic tactics uh, preferably, at least to me, I, I really want wish it kind of didn't siphon itself into like individual campus quote unquote campaigns, but like maintains this like mass movement character, uh, because I think that was like really the strength of it all, uh, at least here in New York City, where many campuses are in proximity, and then I feel like everyone fed of each other's strengths all across the country. But I think I was building up to say that. And now in this kind of post encampment in New York City, it feels like a lot of more autonomous groups are kind of throwing themselves everywhere in regards, uh, I don't know, to maybe a strategy. And I don't mean it as a critique. I think this comes from like general place of like, we need to keep up the pressure. Like we cannot be like no business as usual during, uh, you know, during genocide. And I think this is exactly like true. Uh but then, you know, I think I feel like we also need to think about like what is strategic and like what are some of the pinpoints that we can press that would where we would be able to yield as much power as we can and then organize more students into the movement to then yield even more power. Um, and now it seems like a lot of more autonomous group are just, you know, we're moving towards occupations and it seems like they're trying to replicate a lot of the uh, activities of the encampments, but maybe on a smaller scale and it turns into um, maybe less effective move um and again i think it all stems from like internal discussion discussions that i think i've had with um uh, you know participant at city college encampment at nyu in columbia of like who is in the leadership like how do people discuss you know the the escalation um strategies like who gets to decide these things does it happen be like in close and like secret like nickname group chats or does it happen like out in the open and you know to me i've kind of really became allergic and uh to this culture of secrecy and i've really i think maybe almost too much kind of wish to embrace this like mass democracy stance uh you know making it irrelevant to like what the administration think or how they might retaliate because we have the numbers we have the chance to to hold our own and, and win this way so yeah but as of now i think we're trying to like reconvene strategize for the fall and like you know, and why do you say specifically like we run a series of trainings, I think nationally and, and like locally around like people are learning how to, you know, file like FOIA uh, requests, like how to research divestments, like how to have a clear analysis of power on campuses and like portfolios of our university in terms of where the finance is coming and going towards, uh, which I think is really important if we really want to pressure like economic um, 
points on our campuses. Yeah, and I'll just, I guess I'll admit that for now. I actually agree a lot with uh, what uh, Daniil had to say as well as Sin about certain things, about um, how we still keep the pressure on the the systems that, you know, are in place that still do uh, fund Israel. Um, I think when it comes to SS State specifically, I think one of the things that we were talking about when it comes to keeping um, the momentum going in the summer is, you know, college has orientations for new students. Uh, that's a good opportunity to let people know that, hey, this is where your money's going. And this is where they said that, you know, this is uh, when they said that they would divest from it. And, uh, you know, just like asking people, like if they feel comfortable about, first of all, the university divesting and also second of all, uh, the fact that, you know, they, they had funded uh, this catastrophe at all. And I think it's, it really is kind of, we, we do live, I, I do agree with uh, Daniel in the sense that we kind of do live in an America now, which is kind of past the encampments in particular, like people are, because of repression and because of many other things, uh, especially the fact that it's summer, uh, people are looking to build uh, momentum and build pressure in ways that aren't just occupations in like camps per se. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. And it does really come down to discussing with uh, your camp, uh, your camp leaders uh, on a way to do this. Um, and another thing that you do have to also obviously account for is the fact that there's probably going to be less bodies on the ground in, over the summer. Like that's just going to be a reality. A lot of people uh, live far away from college or, you know, they go home or something like that, you know? So that's just, you know, that's something that, that um, you can deal with too, especially now since that like a lot of the work that is done for the camps and the actions taken at the camps is not just on like it's not just in person, you know, it's also making flyers, it's also making, you know, social media posts, things like that, uh, which can be done re remotely for some of that stuff, at least. Uh, and, and you know, that really does give the opportunity, you know, it gives opportunities for people that want to be involved with the camps but can't be there physically over the summer because they're far away. It gives them the opportunity to, you know, do be able to do something. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, we we do kind of live in sort of like this perfect storm in terms of uh you know getting people energized about Palestine, you know not only you know are people waking up and that's like the first thing they see on their social media feed you know all the different types of atrocities that Palestinians have been going through for for many many decades now especially in the last couple of months but I mean my own sister who who just uh graduated high school you know I'm hearing from her now like about like all this stuff that is on her social media showing up about Palestine or like, you know, the, even uh, since she's, she's been touring colleges as well. Uh, even the people that she's met at universities um, that are also going to be like freshmen, um, even the, the way that they talk about things like Palestine and it's like everybody kind of knows and everybody's willing to do something about it and especially the younger crowd. And so, and I think one of the biggest factors of that is like, you know, when it comes to university culture or like the culture of education in the United States, a lot of it is obviously in English since this was a former, you know, British colony. And, and uh, that, that right, right before Israel colonized uh, Palestine, it was also the British there. And so all of a sudden we, we have, a lot of these um, Palestinian Arab journalists uh, and, uh, you know, people on the ground taking all these photos and videos and uh, giving interviews in English and, and, and providing content for viewers in English. It sucks to call it content because it's really not. It's really just like they're documenting their own, like, catastrophe. But it is, I feel like that is a huge factor and it's, it's, it's one that is a little overlooked sometimes. The fact that you know, the the people on the ground reporting about what's happening in Palestine are doing so not only in Arabic, but in English. And that has really uh, galvanized the support for Palestine in places like America and potentially Australia and potentially other former and current British colonies because English is just so ingrained in the education system. Like, even if you're an international student, 
you are taking your courses in English. You are interacting with your professors and your peers in English for the most part, even if you're from like a non-English speaking country. So uh, yeah, like I think there's a lot of opportunities going forward, whether it's over the summer or even in fall. And a lot of what we are planning for is for fall. Uh, even if we have to like recamp, which we are completely prepared for. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about is like basically just like energizing the youth, you know, and they are fairly like energized. They're fairly aware. They're fairly, you know, very, very angry <laughs> about what's, what's happening and, uh, and the United States complicity in it. So yeah, that's, that's what I got to say. Yeah, I'm glad that you guys have touched on the kind of the role of the media and this idea of like the whole like live streamed genocide because I think it's a really important aspect and particularly I guess as well how it's shown up the kind of bias and hypocrisy of the mainstream media when they're saying you know the kind of pro-Zionist line uh, that is clearly refuted by what you're seeing on your you know Instagram feeds or whatever it is um, but just talking about kind of keeping up the the pressure um, of the movement. Um, I wanted to talk uh, more about the the union uh, actions and things that have happened. So we've seen there's been some inspiring kind of union action supporting the encampments and the students, um, including I believe I think it's Sin is a member of the UAW local, uh, which is United Auto Workers Local 4811. Um, but yeah, for, for people who haven't seen this stuff, could you kind of explain what actions the unions have taken, um, you know, obviously at the campuses you're involved in, but also across the country and what kind of impact has that had? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so again, UAW 4811 is waging a political strike for Palestine free speech. Earlier I said a little bit about the significance of it. One is that uh, it's a huge learning curve for us. For It's the first time many people in our my generation are waging a political strike on such a large scale. And we know the challenges that come with that. Like, you know, um, this obvious, you know, taking stances on social justice issues affects, you know, other kinds of union work. And, um, you know, uh, how, how do we start relating to our coworkers on this basis? Or like, you know, we, we have the benefit of operating in like a more politicized union, but that's not necessarily the case around the country. So all these kind of uh, different, you know, pieces, I think make this a really special occasion. The other uh, part of its significance is that depending on the level of coordination between workers and student campers, it can be one of the most meaningful demonstrations of the combined force of the student and labor movements in U.S. history. Um, although I'll speak about the challenges that, uh, around that more later. Um, but in terms of like the specific actions that our union is taking, uh, we're striking both teaching and grading labor right now. Um, so we've taken strategic cues from the UAW uh, stand-up strike wa waged by auto workers last fall into the winter. Um, so that means, um, you know, certain campuses are being called to, to strike their labor while other campuses are, are not. So my campus right now isn't on strike. And one part of the reason why is because uh, our timeline is different for than pretty much every single school in the system besides UC Merced. Uh, we're a semester school. We end like a couple weeks earlier than the, the rest of the unit. And so, um, you know, by the time we called this strike authorization vote, it, it was like, you know, most of our grades were in, classes were over. And so we didn't have a lot of leverage um, to hold on to. But um, for all the other quarter system schools around the state, they've... Uh, you know, been able to walk out onto the line and the strategy one, obviously the university doesn't know who's going to be hit first, but it's also um, a way for us to plan around the uneven organization of our union. You know, some campuses were, uh, you know, uh, more ahead than others, you know. So anyways, the stand up strike strategy has allowed us to, to uh, no negotiate around the uneven organization of our union um, in terms of challenges like, you know, uh, one one big thing is developing coordination. Uh, I mean, this has already been a huge problem within the camps themselves. Um, you know, we work in a large university system. Oftentimes, these camps are just operating on the campus level. You know, we need to develop strategic coordination between all the different camps. And then there's the added factor of building coordination between the camps and the union. I'll give you one concrete example of like a decision or, or question that came up one night. So, you know, one school was told that they got their last best and final offer a couple days before we would know the results of the strike authorization vote. And so they faced this question, which ultimately, you know, transformed into another kind of consideration. But this is how they were thinking in the moment. Like, there's a high possibility that we're going to get raided tonight. Do we try to withstand that and risk getting swept and people becoming hurt, demoralized, there's jobs jeopardized? Do we do that or do we potentially, you know, back up 
you know, uh, pack up before curfew, come back when the strike is authorized or come back tomorrow when, you know, the curfew is over. And then we do this for a couple of days, then the strike is authorized. And then maybe we can talk about escalating in terms of like fighting the police and stuff like that. So um, these are the kind of questions that people are facing. And it's a privilege to face them because no other camp has been able to escalate alongside the prospect of a strike. But, you know, these decisions should obviously be crafted together between the camps and and the union would and you know a lot of coordination is happening on like an individual level but by and large there's no like you know uh but by and large uh the student movement i would say is operating pretty autonomously from the labor the labor side of things and, and vice versa um and in terms of like other kinds of union actions i mean other unions haven't uh, not too many have gone on strike, but they've taken really significant steps regardless. Um, they're, they've had day-long sick outs and walkouts even in you know, the South, places like I think University of Texas. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's right, but it's one of the Texas schools. Um, you know, other places like at CUNY, professors and, and at uh, Columbia as well, professors have formed human pickets around the camps and stuff. Um, and, you know, we've seen actions vary from more like individual ideological like union members taking these actions to like formally sanction union actions so um yeah like i said before it's 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 a really novel moment and it's been a huge learning curve for us because there's so many different levels of coordination and because it's such a political issue it's an interesting question how to marry that with the the other more day-to-day or economic aspects of our union work if anyone has anything to add feel free but um we had quite a good uh, at the University of Sydney, the, the kind of tertiary education union passed a historic kind of boycott motion uh, to boycott Israel that was, you know, you know, able to happen because of the pressure that the encampments were putting on. Um, so that was quite a good win. I think there was also construction workers refused to do uh, continue their construction work at one of the universities because they had uh, threatened the students as well. So there's been some uh, kind of good examples like that here as well. Uh, I'm not sure if if Daniel or Amaya had anything to add more on the on the union actions. Um, yeah, maybe just a touch, uh, because I feel like right now, you know, we're really kind of peeling our eyes to 4811 and the UC, and we really think that, you know, this like political strike, you know, can be a game changer, and I feel like. At City College and like in New York City in general, we had maybe like a similar, we, we not, not similar, I should, you know, strike that, but like clear connect between labor and student movements was, I think, became very apparent from the get go because faculty and staff and who are, you know, unionized professors, adjuncts, part timers, full time, tenure track. Um, were in the encampment. Obviously, this is like a much more like radical layer of like rank and file of the union, uh, and you know, you know, maybe like radical leftist academics, which you know there are plenty of, um, that were in there that you know cared, and in some ways maybe it helped mobilize some other broader layer of uh, members of the PSC CUNY, right? Professional Staff con Congress, like faculty and staff. I, it's a it's a very large union. I think around like 30,000 members. Um, all of them who like teach and work at CUNYs. But I feel like the opposite kind of a reverse issue that have occurred where now we see UCs and UAW in those, in, in, in that region, you know, the strike is being, I guess, in some ways spearheaded by the leadership through that, like, previous, like, reform efforts. If we talk about, like, connection and, like, rank and file action in union reform, you know, making it more militant, democratic, it would clearly see, like, a fruit of that um, coming in. Of course, like, rank and file strategy and socialists and leftist activists taking job in these strategic industries is a core part of, uh, of that reform. Um, however, at City College and a CUNY, much more, you know, stagnant union and much more, like, much less militant union. Um, we see this, like, organized, like, maybe core, much more advanced layer of members kind of butting heads with the leadership because they didn't seem want to endorse the encampment movement, even though one of the demands that we presented at City College was, you know, like, a recognition of a contract a good contract for the faculty members who have been working for a, over a year without a new contract that expired um, last year. So we clearly strive to make these connections. And then we saw, you know, um, 
PSC leadership rejecting that and I don't know, not denouncing it openly, but you know, they didn't pick a side in this conflict. And it seemed to, I think, A, brought us down much quicker than it otherwise would. And I think it failed to maybe meet a political moment that would have clearly benefited the labor in this situation, which, you know, maybe speaks to like, you know, how, how, how much more union reform and how still, I don't want to say backward, but maybe like less advanced labor in the United States is, but, you know, I feel like UC and UW particularly giving us hope in the sense that the strategy that we're utilizing to orient ourselves and entrench ourselves in the labor movement is working. And I think we just need to do um, more of it. Um, yeah. And that's Can I just add can I just add one thing? I just want to talk about the relationship of the left to the labor movement. We have to recognize that the strike is possible, largely because, you know, our union has a more politicized base. When we look at the membership of left socialist organizations in the country, it largely reflects like grad workers and other kinds of professional workers than, say, hard manufacturing or logistics or whatnot. And it's important to recognize our distance from these sectors because they are more central to the process in many ways. And none of this discounts the importance of an academic strike. You know, the UAW strike has been, you know, immensely inspiring, um, you know, just brave and politicizing. But like, if you want to have a more direct role in stopping this genocide, go target those logistics, you know, logistics shipping companies, the workers, you know, who deliver the arms, like they got to be organized too. And we have to root left ideas in these unions. And that is, you know, not a process that is going to unfold overnight. And so the left has to develop a more sophisticated sophisticated, you know, plan around that, which is why a lot of these, you know, socialist organizations called, you know, talk about something called the rank and fall strategy, one very important tactic of which is like, you know, radicals joining, you know, these strategic sectors, organizing these unions to have more uh, left programs and a better internal democratic culture, because, you know, ultimately, you can't stand up from the outside and tell these workers, you got to withhold, you know, your, you know, you know, your labor around this, this or that thing, you got to build trust for your ideas. And so, um, yeah, th I think that's a, a bigger part of the picture that, you know, um, is going to take a lo lot more time to, to make progress around. I was just going to say, as far as, uh, as far as strikes go, and as far as, um, like major labor actions go, that even San Francisco state looks to for, for guidance and as like inspiration, I think, uh, the UAW strike is is the big one, like by far. That's the one that I think everybody's kind of talking about, and that's the that's the demands. The demands coming from them are the ones that we're listening to too. Uh, especially like things about like, well, I'm not entirely sure if this was UAW, but there was a general call from PYM, I think, um, saying that we need to, you know, target Maersk and all these shipping companies that like, um, are complicit. To, uh, in terms of like you know sending weapons to Israel uh, and so if like a rank and file strategy could be more effective in, in companies like that you know is a really converse, important conversation to have especially since you know these are the companies that are part of the logistics of, of this genocide happening in the first place so yeah yeah thanks I was just going to ask another question, but also just, you know, this Gaza solidarity encampment movement started off with just a few students taking action. And that inspired thousands of others around the world to do the same. And it's just created this political crisis for the establishment. I remember one of you saying in the last interview that you don't need to be a professional revolutionary to get involved in organizing and standing up for social justice issues, because there were always people wanting to support the Palestine movement, but didn't know how until this moment when they created the opportunity to send a clear message around the world that universities must cut ties with Israel and, and Israel's genocidal assault of Gaza. But we wanted to ask what impact has this moment had on student organizing, particularly within the Palestine solidarity movement? and maybe draw on some of the lessons learned for future actions, but also what what the role um, of the organized left is playing. I think for, uh, I can speak a little bit when it comes to SS State. Um, SS State's uh, relationship with the student left and with organizing is one that's, you know, it has, there's a history there. Uh, you know, whether even before uh, Vietnam, uh, there were, 
you know, student strikes, some of the largest in the country uh, for civil rights and, and things like that. So, you know, it's a, there's always been a lot of organizations with student organizations within SF State that were focused very, very stringently on like leftist issues. Um, and I think that has really just continued. But I feel like there was a little bit of a plateau of that type of organizing or those type of, um, you know, those types of student organizations. Like, I feel like they plateaued around like 20 or 30 years ago, uh, where most of the organizations that were involved with any form of activism stayed the same. Like we had League of Filipinos. We still have for that matter. We have League of Filipino Students. Uh, we have La Raza, which represents the Hispanic uh, students that are involved in activism in our campus. Uh, we have uh, queer-centric uh, act- advocacy organizations um, at SF State, and we've had those for a while as well. Um, but it's it's largely stayed the same. And of course, we have GUPS, the General Union of Palestine Students, but that was there for a long time. So, you know, those were the main orgs, as well as Black Student Union and a couple of others, that you know, were primarily, they existed for a kind of dialogue and a kind of uh, organizing, community organizing and student organizing around uh, leftist issues. Uh, But it stayed the same for a while. But what I can definitely say is, I think when after the camps or like maybe during or yes, uh, right before the camps started as SF State, a lot more student organizations uh, started to pop up and ones that were very explicitly political and uh, and uh, cater to the student left, essentially. They started popping up. Uh, one of the orgs that I can talk about is House Block, which is a queer and trans resource and advocacy organization uh, for Black folks. Uh, that was one of the organizations I remember was founded literally this year, right before the encampments, I think. Uh, and then there was a couple of other organizations. There's an anti-imperialist organization, like an explicitly anti-imperialist organization at SF State now, uh, which is called Resist, uh, which is, and their whole, um, their model of organizing revolves around all types of imperialist actions conducted by the United States. So that includes things like APEC, RIMPAC, uh, all these sort of military exercises that the United States uh, conducts around the globe to spread its imperial sort of talons. Uh, there's that. And then I can talk a little bit about uh, the organization that I was a co-founder of. Um, and we started this organization right before the camps as well, or like a couple of months before, actually. But like we were still in the planning stages and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, a bit, And that organization is South Asian Federation which is a, oh, give me a second. Uh, that organization is called South Asian Federation, which is an, uh, it's a student organization uh, for not only just South Asians, but also people interested in South Asian issues uh, that is explicitly socialist. It is an explicitly uh, leftist sort of organization that focuses on issues in the Indian subcontinent as well as outside, like the diaspora of South Asia. Uh, from a very leftist perspective, like of a predominantly anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist perspective. And so what I think has happened, not just uh, in organ- our organization, but also just like in organizations all around uh, my campus, also Student Union, which is the student union movement that uh, was more active last semester. Uh, but Sorry, not more active, but like it started last semester, essentially. Uh, but what's happened is that Palestine is a like an issue, as a fundamental issue. So not necessarily the camps themselves, but Palestine ha- as an issue has really contributed in the last couple of months to a sort of consciousness in within universities in America that I have not seen ever. Like I, I, I think like that kind of plateau I was talking about at SS State. I wouldn't be surprised if that sort of like the the models around organizing around the country kind of plateaued until Palestine. Like it's really, I feel like the severity of the issue 
as well as just like how in your face it is now uh, through social media or otherwise. Uh, and even through our elected leadership, like they are, ha- they have to talk about it, even if they haven't been talking favorably from the Palestinian point of view. Like, you know, Joe Biden has to talk about this shit like you can't escape it. So, yeah, I think that's really played a huge part in terms of really making people not only aware, but also active, like politically active, politically, uh, you know, principled, you know, uh, whatever principles they, that, you know, people want to hold, like even if they're, they're Zionists, like it's, it's made them more politicized in general. And that is just a, an observation I've had from the perspective of as a state, which it, you know, this is an, a, a campus that was known for organizing very heavily in the 60s that has suddenly, be, like, quite literally suddenly become way more political active, I think, because of Palestine. Yeah, I mean, the influence of this process on stu- student and other kinds of political struggles to come, I, I just so hard to overstate. And I think it's been so impactful from so many different angles. So one thing that I've been thinking about is just the demographics of people involved. It's much more diverse than any other movement I've participated in. We've seen the rise of, you know, Arab leadership. And also this is uh, a movement that is very distrustful of, you know, politics as is, especially the, you know, the party status quo, you know, they're very distrustful of Democrats and Republicans. I mean, it's still a live dispute what the orientations movement, the the movement, sorry, orientation is to the state. Um, but I think it's very positive that a lot of people have the instinct that, you know, we're not going to get what we want by playing nice or asking nicely or lobbying we need to hold these people's feet to the fire and actually overhaul the system um it seems like that's a lot of people's thinking um instinctually even if they haven't you know participated in socialist groups before or anything like that and also because you know this movement they've come to that conclusion too because this movement has zero almost zero political representation i mean we have a champion and rashida and you know to a little bit of a lesser extent other people in the squad although they've been outspoken too um but you know it, it's going to require more than like a handful of these you know, individuals or personalities, we need a party, in my opinion. And so um, this is the movement that has been most politicized in the direction that I've participated in in my lifetime. So I think that takeaway is really important. And I think the quality of political experiences people are having is just also unparalleled. I mean, we're starting from a low baseline. You know, in the last interview, I talked about how certain developments in the last couple of years have transformed the left and the student movement. But the fact of the matter is that most people in society and on our campuses have very little experience taking collective action. And even those who have done political organizing before, like, you know, us in this room, uh, we haven't, I, I at least haven't worked with as ideologically broad and dynamic a movement as this one. You know, most encampments involved a huge array of organizations and so many people with varying levels of political experiences and ideas about how the world works and how to change it. Um, Working with these people, debating with them, just figuring out next steps is just an immensely risk process that I, yeah, haven't had the opportunity before uh, to deal with. Um, and also another thing is that like the rhythm of these protest movements is like so different from well, not s- drastically different, but it's different in certain ways from the labor and electoral campaigns that a lot of us have uh, a lot of us are used to or have had experience with before. Um, you know, the organizing fundamentals may be the same, but there's no, like, you know, for example, definitive election date or deadline to build up to. Many of the tactics we're using are really novel, and so we're getting experience with that. Um, And I think what the novelty of this situation more generally means for us is that we, for the first time, a lot of us have confronted questions about, like, how to build movement democracy with so many different elements at play. Like, democracy, you know, you know, I pride myself on participating in, you know, in YDSA, where we're a democratic member-run organization. We can always approve and improve on that front, but, like, the democracy there is in very much much more easier to build in some ways because you're in a room of people who already agree with you to a very large extent boom now you're in this movement where people don't agree with you and that these are exactly the people that we need to win over to socialist politics so this is the first time you know we're thinking about questions of like how do we make like certain you know interventions make sense to people who have no like organizational background whatsoever so that's been really really beneficial um um yeah i, I can name a bunch of challenges that we're facing there there's a long laundry list but the most important thing is that this movement has provided us a real meaningful context to grapple with these challenges instead of abstractly. Um, so while, you know, these problems are, you know, real and, and limiting in so many different ways, it's it's really profound too, because we're learning so much. Yeah, I, I agree personally with a lot of what Ami and Sinev said, um, but I'll try to maybe outline something more like concrete list of some of the stuff that I've, I've been thinking about. A lot of maybe will echo some of the internal discussion that we've had in why do you say, and some of the stuff that maybe I've been thinking about personally, individually, 
Uh, but, you know, maybe it's a lesson that I think can be coupled in together is that I think we need to reject sectarianism and we need to reject um, security culture um, in the sense that, you know, there has been some bizarre cases in some of the encampments where people were unable to use their, you know, real names or like, there was an uh, kind of hidden secret structure that in my analysis, in many cases, have brought down many encampments. But I think, you know, Sin was spot on when they said that this is something new. I don't think that, you know, we as, you know, particularly like YDSA members, which is primarily the organization, which I personally have a lot of, like most of my organizing experience and um, is not something like we have done before. And so, you know, we just need to dare to struggle and dare to win and experiment and it's okay to fail. And we learn as much from mistakes as we learn from, um, you know, victories, if not more. And I guess the lesson that I've learned is that we need to be open-minded and experimental and, you know, exciting to ex ex exciting to, yeah, to meet, to meet particular uh, moment and then be able to reconvene and, you know, prepare for another um, flow. Um, yeah, and it seems like something so novel and maybe like mind altering in terms of like my own organizing kind of approach is that in the past, a lot of the kind of the YDSA organizational model was, you know, there's a chapter on campus. It consists of like, you know, X number of people, usually maybe like a few dozen. That's kind of maybe one of the stronger chapters. You'll have like uh, 100 people and 50 that's some of the most, you know, militant strong chapters. Usually it will be around 20 people, but they would run, you know, some sort of YDSA for issue X, you know? And through that, they will like talk to students, not necessarily like engage in some sort of, I don't know, quote unquote coalition building or like organizing with other campus club, club campus clubs, maybe some of them, a few, but, you know, they remain this kind of like a central anchor in the political campaign, whether it is for, you know, issue on campus or issue in their community. But, you know, it kind of remained housed within YDSA and the goal was to like bringing other people into the org. Um, but I think like throughout the encampment, something have really changed where I think we're really opening up and, you know, wrestling in this political movement with other groups that don't necessarily agree with us. And now immediately we have to raise questions of what's our role in this. And I feel like I'm really hoping to see that we move away maybe from, and it's still applicable in some cases for sure, this model of like YDSA for like issue X or the organization for issue X, but instead of embracing the model of like building a uh, movement on campus that consists of many, many more students and which include, you know, organized leftist clubs, culture clubs, uh, other spaces, the students in general that really encompass this like mass character of it. Um, and, you know, now we think about, like, what's our role as, you know, organized left in this moment? And I think our role was, you know, doing that spade work, being movement builders, you know, not necessarily like agitators or sectarians, but someone that is entrenched in a struggle, that is participating, that gets to know people, that talks to people, you know, mobilizing uh, organizational skills from the labor movements, you know, mapping out our campuses, our encampments, and really you know, put in the work. And sometimes that means, you know, you have to do an extra shift at the inventory tent, or you have to do a run around the security for the camp, you know, uh, just like anybody else. And that what makes you a trusted leader. I think a lot of us figured out and that's what makes you, you know, influential and allows you to push for your political vision much more efficiently. Um, and even then, you know, we need to cohere like on many layers as an org, as a, I don't know, a caucus or in this bigger movement and think about recruiting people and like sharing your own politics, you know, don't be shying away from, you know, our political vision. Um, and to me, I guess, I mean, as, as long as, you know, many, many others who I'm inspired by thinking about like, how do we take this moment and funnel in into the labor movement you know how do we take these student activists activists and people that have been radicalized by this moment and wants to change the system that have you know didn't listen to them at the camp that have beaten them up um and how do we prevent them from you know being funneled into this world of ngos or maybe particularly more harmful harmful and like predatory in the u.s that are absorbing these struggles uh and you know seeding them to the democratic party uh and instead you know how can we 
funnel these people into the labor movement where they actually can wield a lot of structural power and, you know, become lifelong socialist organizers. Um, and then, you know, organize in their workplaces, um, organize and go on strikes and become leaders. And then how do they relate that to, you know, the state? And we can go as far as, I don't know. Yeah, and it's just, how do we create that pipeline and how do we then transform the society out of this movement in the coming years is really exciting. And yeah, and I think like even this is a great part of it. And so it's, 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 it's really, I feel like, I feel like we can be bold and we can be, um, I don't know, aspirational. Okay. Well, I was going to come in, actually, that's a good segue into the kind of final kind of question we wanted to cast, which is a bit of a concluding one, but obviously, uh, the main kind of political <laughs> kind of thing that's going to be, um, happening in the United States. And I'm sure you kind of are going to be dreading this moment, uh, the two 2024 presidential, um, presidential elections, um, which are obviously going to be taking place in November. Now, I kind of want to ask, um, because we've been reading reports, it's quite clear that Biden is absolutely feeling the pressure um, in uh, over 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 his support for for Israel, and of course we can see that reflect in the fact that he is very he is attempting to negotiate some um, a, a ceasefire agreement um, within within Gaza. Um, it, there's also the context, there's also the threat that he is facing. In fact, I read a recent um, article that stated that uh, within the Democrat kind of voters, there is actually one in five Democrat voters that will not vote for Biden on the basis of his support um, support for Israel and um, and also his support for the genocide in Gaza more broadly. And in fact, and that and that is impacting on five key states um, that the Democrats need to secure um, to win. And so, yeah, I guess my kind of question is really um, some of your reflections and some of your thoughts on how the Palestine Solidarity Movement is impacting on um, on uh, on this on the presidential elections, but also more broadly the role of the Democrats. Because I guess I mean, as someone who has you know, I have friends in the United States. Um, you know, I know for, I have friends um, that, you know, they're the types that have always voted blue, no matter what. But they are basic. But a number of these friends have radicalized quite quickly, and basically, they all ba they're basically coming from the perspective that they will not vote for the Democrats um, ever again, um, and they do not see any meaningful difference between uh, Trump and Biden, which is actually quite a radical shift. And I'm sure that radical shift is also happening in the context of the Palestine movement um, right now. But of course, I guess the other <laughs> the other challenge as well is I also do sympathise uh, with um, <laughs> with the element of, you know, the, the kind of left-wing voting base feeling trapped um, within the within the democratic kind of machine, because yeah, unlike unlike the unlike the United States in Australia, we can just easily vote for a fair, um, for 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 a third party candidate with no consequence whatsoever. Um, so that hence why the Greens, for example, in Australia are basically, you know, a growing uh, left wing party that basically has captured uh, the conscious sort of left vote within within so um, within Australia. So yeah, just I'm definitely interested in hearing your reflections on this because I think it is the kind of big political question for the left to kind of grapple with. Yeah, it's kind of tough. Uh, I need to gather my thoughts. So yeah, if anybody else wants to go first. Um, yeah, it's fair. that's fair. Um, I can I can go. Uh, this is I guess more reflective of how I feel. Uh, I've also voted blue in the past because of uh because of things like labor, like uh or, or the labor movement and its association with you know particularly the Bernie Sanders, uh in 2016 and in 2020, um. That was, I think, in that moment for for a lot of Americans, especially Americans that lean left or or vote blue in general, uh, it was an important moment because it exposed a young generation of Americans to, um, you know, to like the actual left or like what we thought was the actual left or like, um, you know, socialist politics, um, late the uh, importance of organizing labor. All of that, I and uh, you know, so I have voted um, blue in the past, and I am definitely not somebody who feels alone. 
in viewing like the the state of the Democratic Party now as as just something that's completely alienating and completely like like distant from whatever politics I hold or whatever principles I hold hold dear, especially when it comes to Palestine. And I think they completely deserve that. Like whatever votes they lose, I mean, it's not like Biden didn't make his bed with with what's happening. Like he supported that. He 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 sent those weapons. He is very, very, very responsible for what's happening in Gaza as much as uh almost as much as the Israeli ad- administration, uh, as Netanyahu, because of the amount of support materially, as well as through propaganda and lies that he's gotten through America, whether it's the media or, you know, the military. And so, yeah, that has really impacted things uh, within the left and also for those that vote uh, usually like on liberal issues. I've I've actually talked to a surprising amount of people that are more like liberal minded and less so socialist uh, minded. Uh, that are also quite disillusioned by uh, Biden's stance on Israel, like very, very, very um, isolated from, uh, or they feel very isolated from you know what they think should uh, uh, the United States policy should be when it comes to uh, the atrocities of the state of Israel. So. Yeah, it's a very complex situation. At the same time, I do feel like if uh if Donald Trump wins the uh uh the twenty twenty four uh election and becomes the president, slim chance, I guess, but you know, you never know. Uh, I think he would actually be worse for the Palestinian people w- within the United States as well as in Palestine. Uh, you know, his stances have been extremely pro Israel. Like he's the one who moved the embassy to Jerusalem, which to occupy Jerusalem, which is not just bizarre, but also like, you know, that's something that could have potentially caused a lot more violence. And it did um, like that alone. And I think, you know, it's it's a very difficult situation we're in as voters, like. In, in, on a in, on a broad sense, because there's also a lot of people that, you know, are not Democrats and are not even like leftists that are like you know that you know are very very alienated from from what Biden's stances on um the genocide are, um, but I think it's something that you know it's it's a bullet that we kind of have to bite as an electorate at some point. Like we have to kind of you know, whether we vote for Biden or we don't, like, I know I won't, but because I, I live in a state that overwhelmingly votes blue all the time. So I'm not as worried here, but like, you know, I like, it feels disingenuous to, at this point, it feels incredibly disingenuous to tell people to vote one way or the other, (laughs) because at the same time, you know, there's folks in states that are losing their reproductive freedom because of, you know, the courts being packed by Republicans, specifically Trump. Um, so it's hard to 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 go up to those folks and be like, hey, please don't vote for Biden because Biden supports genocide. Like, I understand if they vote for Biden, honestly. Like, I, I don't necessarily condone it, but like, uh, well, because of other things, but like, you know, I t- totally understand, like, you know, people's basic, freedoms are at risk in the United States. And uh, Trump has also come out and said that he would, you know, expel pro-Palestinian protesters from the country, that he would send them to Gaza and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I mean, I get it. If you want to vote for Biden over Trump, I just think that, you know, there's there's definitely that level of dissent uh, towards Biden is stratospheric now. It is just stratospheric and it's only going to get worse. Uh, but yeah. I guess I was I'm, I was thinking about this one in five number that Jacob that you've mentioned. I guess I'll be curious to like, <laughs> sorry, like maybe hear like the citation for that. I guess I'm, it's going off from um, like the numbers of the uncommitted campaign voters uh, that have been um, that a lot of like left, including like DSA, have been pushing towards. Um, to vote in a democrat to vote uncommitted in the states where this option is possible in a democratic primary which is i think an indicator of a larger dissent and like 
support for uh, ceasefire and uh, support to end the genocide, which is translates into, you know, dissent against Biden. Uh, but I think in a primary, which was largely uncompetitive, uh, unlike, you know, maybe some of the previous years, uh, it's it's an indicator, but maybe it's a weaker lever of power. And I'm, I would be, you know, would not be surprised if it actually much more people would come out um, to vote for Biden. But I'm speaking maybe a bit generally like less politicized public. Something I think I've seen in our spaces and on the left is clear, you know, disillusionment. Uh, I feel like even before, I think specifically before the encampment movement, people had a clear analysis of Biden's complicity in the ongoing violence and the ongoing genocide. But, you know, people still feared of like Trump's uh, re-election and his, you know, kind of proto-fascist agenda and his cabinet, how horrible it will be for, you know, labor, like I may have mentioned, uh, as well as other stuff like issues of, you know, uh, bodily autonomy, um, uh, our schools, you know, um, DSA, you know, has a lot of trans folks in him. So like their, you know, safety and future was, was a big concern. And so people were like, you know, maybe considering like a vote in a swing state, you know, but I feel like it after the encampment and it is become like a very much more denouncing no. Um, because like this like clear like violence that have returned like a boomerang back home in our campuses, I think was a very shocking wake up call. Um, and I feel like it has made the situation for the Democrats in generally much, much worse. Um, yeah, and I feel like what it calls for, as Cinna mentioned earlier, is the need for a new independent party. I feel like if we continue to fight for some way of election reform, if we continue to fight for, um, you know, some ways to, you know, manipulate, I don't know, ballot lines to push for independent identity uh, away from the Democrats, even if we, you know, run technically on the Democratic Party, like we do in New York City, for example, where we openly, with some of our candidates, openly say we are the Democratic Socialists and we're running for this, despite being on the... Um, democratic you know being members of the democratic party and like you know running in democratic primaries you know i feel like this independent identity to start is very very critical for i guess our success on maybe electoral front uh and i guess that's maybe more of a focus on like local stuff and local races not you know presidential and maybe something much more in the spotlight for international you know scene but i think that it really speaks to the need for a new independent force that must come out, I think, out of DSA and the labor movement, uh, which will then become a fighting alternative and representation for the working class um, against both, you know, right wing Republicans and, um, you know, moderate centrist Democrats who are now like openly complicit in uh, Palestinian genocide. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll just, you know, maybe leave it at that, you know, it, yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I, I have a lot of just confused and, and conflicting thoughts about this. I mean, it's just to talk briefly about the movement's impact on the Democrats. I mean, it's demonstrated itself to be a decisive factor in the outcome of the election, although not decisive enough to stop the genocide, which is very unfortunate. Um, but we've seen absolutely damning results from the uncommitted movement, which was this movement to, in the primaries, fill out your ballot saying, I'm not committed to voting for Joe Biden. I'm going to but it's probably in the uncommitted or like, you know, no preference for the uh, candidate kind of portion of the ballot um, to signal that I'm dissatisfied with Biden's foreign policy. So that movement, especially in the state of Michigan, just blew past their internal go internal goals by like tenfold, I think. Um, then this encampment movement takes off. You know, we haven't won a majority of society or campus, but we flipped a lot of staunch Democratic supporters, which are going to make the difference. You know, there are parents, for example, who have always voted blue and are now refusing to because their Democratic mayors have just stuck the police on uh, on their own children. And there are a million more examples of how, you know, the Palestine movement has drawn out the hypocrisy and absolute bankruptcy of the Democratic Party. But I think the more interesting question is, like, what, what the fuck should we do about it, especially as members of socialist organizations? And I think the word you use, trapped, is the perfect way to describe it. And I'll just lay out some considerations for you. So there are some short-term considerations, um, you know, 
uh, that are absolutely in contradiction with like longer or more medium term goals. And the short term being like we recognize the dangers of a Trump presidency, especially in terms of like, you know, the ability of workers to organize and defend our rights and stuff like that. Meanwhile, we have medium and long term considerations, especially around this life changing movement that we all participated in. And the base of this movement is prim primarily young radicals, many of them people of color, exactly the type of people we want to be bringing into socialist organization. And most of them do not want to touch Biden or the Democratic Party with a, with a, a million foot pole you know, endorsing Biden, even on a tactical level, even putting out a billion statements saying that he does not reflect our politics. We condemn his foreign policy and various other things. Even if we made all these qualifications and a hundred more doing a tactical endorsement of Biden would be non-negotiable for a lot of these people. And that's valid. The shit is horrible. And so like, how do we bring them into our organization, but also thwart the, the prospect of a Trump presidency? So there, I, I, in my mind, there's like not really any satisfying way to square the circle. Moreover, you know, there's the fact that even if we did have a program that could harmonize both these sets of goals, the left is not a decisive factor in national politics, and we're still quite marginal. And this marginality is coming out in a really interesting way in debates, for, for example, in DSA about who to endorse and, and, and what conditions we're going to give our endorsements under, um, especially around people like Bowman. You know, on the one hand, people, you know, like, you know, Bowman and a lot of these federal level um, Elected are not disciplined to our organizations. They're actually really responsible and accountable to a lot of liberal and more contradictory political groups. On the other hand, you know, they're the best known tribunes of like the broad left and progressives, you know? So some people say, you know, we just got to endorse them, hold our nose, because that's how we gain a base. Well, okay, that might come at the, spent, at, at the expense of politics and, and principles. And these people might and also have in the past voted for more Iron Dome funding and stuff like that. On the other hand, you have people who want to deal with this problem by saying, you know, let's lay down our principles, set expectations and say, you know, let's just not endorse or engage. I'm sympathetic to, uh, you know, laying down expectations. But this is also another symptom of the problem of marginality is that, you know, we we don't win necessarily a base by doing that in the end. So the, the the bigger question and challenge for us is how to break out of this cycle. And and one thing that we've been debating and contemplating, it's not like by any means like a shared organizational opinion or something, but one article that's been really impactful for me that I want to shout out is this piece by um uh, Nick French and Jeremy Gong about how uh, they wrote it around the time of um, the Bernie campaign. This just came up because I learned that people in France were reading this recently, which was like cool to know. It's kind of random how they chanced upon it. But anyways, I've been thinking about it because they wrote this at the end of the Bernie campaign where they're like, uh, you know, instead of just scattering to the winds, Bernie should have used his platform to call for this broader political organization that fights around his like social democratic platform. And, you know, I think coming out of this movement, we do need some political representation in a broader catch-all movement organizations because it's clear that, you know, not everyone is ready to enter socialist organization at this point or our goals and, and politics might seem lofty or disconnected. Like, you know, we have reading groups about the Russian Revolution or whatever. Some people are just like, I want to focus on on Palestine and stuff like that. And so um, there, there's got to be a good way for people to you know, commit to these politics more long term. And we need to find an organizational form for that and a political program for that, too. And so it, it's really hard. And I see, I mean, this Palestine movement was a really great place to experiment and, and start, start figuring out what that program might look like. But I think the left is still really, really confused around this question. Well, thanks so much um, to the three of you, Sin, Daniel, and Amea, about, for giving us your time again um, this uh, for this uh, podcast or video or however, however people are engaging with it. Um, we've obviously we could probably talk for hours and hours about all the different uh, you know things that could happen, but unfortunately we've got to obviously wrap it up at some point. Um, so we'd love to do another. Uh, chat with you guys again at, at another point uh, in the future um but also i mean just with this interview and the the previous one if people have should check that out as well there's a, so much to think about and chew through and um apply to the struggles that we're having here in australia as well or uh internationally um so yeah just thanks again for for chatting with us if people have enjoyed this interview they can uh find more on at greenleft.org.au and become a supporter for as little as five dollars a month which help us keep this work going so um thanks again for your time comrades <laughs>